I am Sister Barbara Reed, President of Catholic Theological Union. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I have the distinct honor of introducing a longtime friend and mentor, Sister Elizabeth Johnson, a member of the Sisters of St. Joseph, Brentwood, New York community. Sister Elizabeth is Distinguished Professor Emerita at Fordham. Fordham University, as you know, is in New York City. But years ago, when I first met her, she was on the faculty of the Catholic University of America in Washington, DC, where she also held the distinction of being the first woman to have earned a PhD in theology at CUA. As a struggling doctoral candidate and emerging feminist, I think I may not have survived without the companionship and mentoring of Beth and the other women faculty and graduate students whom Beth invited into a group to explore new feminist ways of doing theology. It was an exciting experience to be among the first to hear what Beth was thinking about in terms of Christology, Mariology, Ecclesiology, work that would later be shared more widely in her groundbreaking books, She Who Is, and Truly Our Sister, to name only a few. Since then, Beth has paved the way in rethinking theologically our connection with all creation, as in her book, Ask the Beasts. And then most recently, she explores the implications for soteriology in her book, Creation and the Cross, The Mercy of God for a Planet in Peril. The impact of Beth's work has been rightly recognized by her colleagues and students alike. She is past president of the Catholic Theological Society of America, and she has earned Fordham's Professor of the Year Award. She has been awarded numerous honorary degrees, but I'm sure the one she treasures most is the one from CTU. Beth has been deeply involved in the life of the church, serving on the national US Lutheran Catholic dialogue, the Vatican sponsored dialogue between science and religion, and the original committee of the Catholic Common Ground Initiative started by Cardinal Joseph Bernardine to reconcile divided factions in the church and whose work continues today through CTU's Bernardine Center. It is my pleasure now to invite Dr. Elizabeth Johnson to speak to us on Enfolded with Affection, Imagining Us in Creation Theology. Beth? Thank you very much, Barbara. And hello to everyone. It is a real pleasure to be invited to give the Dr. Barry Rankin lecture this year. From everything I've heard, he was a wonderful man, filled with commitment and dynamic imagination. He envisioned that CTU could exist and helped bring it into existence. And the focus of this series in his memory is God's creation, which dovetails with my own theological interest. So for me, this is a double pleasure. I'd like to begin by explaining the title of this talk, Enfolded with Affection, Imagining Us in Creation Theology, and then develop the idea in two points. First, insights from papal teaching, and second, animals as an example. To set the context, we are in the midst of a devastating ecological crisis on our planet. Climate change, glaciers melting and sea levels rising, causing extraordinary storms, wildfires, droughts and floods. There is gross pollution, depletion of natural resources and fresh water, all leading to disease and death for human beings, especially poor people, and extinction of species. In 2015, Pope Francis issued the encyclical Laudato Si, as you know, on care for our common home. In my opinion, this is the most important encyclical in the history of all encyclicals. In it, 
Francis writes that all creatures on this planet are loved by God, who, and here's the quote, enfolds with affection, even the least of beings. Therefore, from a God's eye point of view, so to speak, human beings do not stand alone as the end all and be all of creation, but together with all others enfolded with divine affection, form what Francis calls one splendid universal communion. Now, if you think about it for a minute, on this momentous point, science and religion are of one mind in this 21st century, not at odds. According to the story science tells, planet Earth coalesced from a cloud of dust and gas left by exploding stars. And then three and one half billion years ago, life ignited here. Subsequently, evolution has brought forth endless forms most beautiful, as Charles Darwin put it, including quite recently, Homo sapiens on the primate branch of the tree of life. Now in a physical and biological sense, interrelationship is not an appendage to the natural order, but it's very lifeblood. Speaking of blood, Human blood is red, as is the blood of other mammals, due to iron, which was forged in those exploding stars, form the crust of the earth from which we evolved. Everything is connected to everything else. It all flourishes or withers together. That's a scientific story. According to the story monotheistic fates tell, planet Earth and all of its evolving life is due to the outpouring of divine love by the one God who makes and sustains all beings, enfolding all with affection so that we form one splendid community of creation. So for science, it's the biosphere. For faith sight, it is the community of creation. But from both fields, science and religion, the result is the same. That we humans are a part of a natural reality and a spiritual reality greater than just ourselves. Now I ask myself, why is it so hard to see this? Why is it so hard to feel this existentially? Why is being part of the community of creation enfolded by divine affection, not the default position of the praying church? Why is it so absent from our everyday preaching and teaching to say nothing of religious practice and public advocacy? How can we begin to imagine ourselves, indeed basically redefine ourselves, in a way that does justice to the ecological reality. In wrestling with this, I came up with one strategy that might help move us forward toward ecological conversion. Take the little pronoun us and stretch it out and imagine it including other creatures along with our human selves. So that's the second part of the title. Now in our polarized human society today, it is already tough to expand the boundary of us beyond our own particular silo to include humans who differ by race, gender, class, sexual orientation, immigration status, political opinion, religion, and other markers by which we shape our personal identities. Thankfully, the core biblical teaching to love your neighbor as yourself exerts a constant pressure to go beyond the limits of our prejudice, to love, respect, and do justice to all people. All human beings are included in us. If this poses a challenge, how much harder it is 
to cross the species line and see other living creatures who are not Homo sapiens included when we say us. However, like loving our human neighbor, faith also challenges us to do just that. Think about it. If there is one God, one holy mystery of love who creates, indwells, and sustains all creatures, who enfolds all with affection, one God whose word became flesh in Jesus Christ as part of the biosphere, this Jesus whose death on the cross puts him in solidarity with all creatures of the flesh who suffer and die and whose resurrection promises a blessed future for the whole shebang. Then when we say us, our imagination rightly includes all our fellow creatures. Now let us drill deeper into this. First, with Pope Francis's encyclical Laudato Si, and then with animals. As you know, Laudato Si is a vast encyclical. It takes seriously our current ecological crisis and effects on human beings, especially poor people, along with thousands of vulnerable species. And it points toward solutions in political, economic, social, cultural, educational, and other areas. But at its center is a spiritual vision of our blue marble of a planet and all its inhabitants as belonging to God, as God's beloved creation. Hence, Francis writes, we need to see ourselves not quote, as lords and masters entitled to plunder the earth at will, and not, quote, as relentless consumers unable to set limits on our immediate needs, and not, again, quote, ruthless exploiters who arrogantly dominate the world. Rather, Francis calls for a new way of being human that enhances rather than diminishes the life of our fellow creatures. Laudato Si challenges the way the Bible has been used to justify human superiority. It is true that some have used the Genesis stories to justify human dominance, but this is, quote, inadequate and frankly, wrong, quote. And Francis goes on to say, even if we Christians have at times incorrectly interpreted the scriptures about dominion, nowadays we must forcefully reject the notion that our being created in God's image and given dominion over the earth justifies domination over other creatures. Instead, we are meant to live in, quote, mutual relation with other creatures sharing together in this one splendid universal communion, all loved by God. This does not mean in any sense that we are all the same, of course not. But precisely as humans in this communion, we need to take up our special responsibility to respect and care for the others who share our common home. To depart from the encyclical for a moment, for centuries, theology drew on ancient Greek philosophy with its dualism of matter and spirit, spirit being closer to God, matter being further away from God. And it presented a picture of the world structured according to what we call the hierarchy of being. At the very lowest level, you had non-living material, just pure matter like rocks. Above that, plants, they have a little spirit, they're alive and they can flourish and die. Above them are the animals, they have some consciousness and locomotion. And above them are human beings, we have a rational soul with mind and a will in our body. Above humans are the angels, they have no body, pure spirits at all. So according to this schema, as 
if you want to uh, use some alliteration, we could say we go that creation is arranged according from the pebble to the peach to the poodle to the person to the principalities and powers all under the primary cause. Now, according to this schema, church teaching held that animals and plants were made primarily for human use. In technical terms, they had instrumental rather than intrinsic value in God's eyes. Note those words. They were created for an, as instruments to serve a purpose of something other than themselves. Consequently, at the end of the world, plants and animals will disappear. Since their purpose is to provide for our needs, once human life on earth is over, we no longer need to eat, their goal would be fulfilled. They would go out of existence. So heaven is for humans only. This pattern of thinking has a profound grip on Christian theology and church teaching. And I include myself in that, even if you try to think differently. It's in the, in the uh, core of what we have inherited. Now, Pope Francis recognizes that he is contributing something new to Catholic teaching by insisting, quote, we are called to recognize that other living beings have a value of their own in God's eyes, end quote. And then redefining what church doctrine had assessed as of lesser worth, he continues forthrightly. In our time, the church does not simply state that other creatures are subordinate to the good of human beings as if they had no worth in themselves and can be treated as we wish. Rather, they have an intrinsic value in God's eyes, independent of their usefulness to us, end quote. There it is, the shift from instrumental value, they have an intrinsic value in God's eyes, independent of whether they're useful to us or not. And why? Because God loves them. And here's the title again. Even the fleeting life of the least of beings is the object of God's love. And in its few seconds of existence, God enfolds it with affection. Commentators have uh, observed that what's being referred to here are the mayflies, these bugs that hatch and within very few hours, they need to find a mate, reproduce, lay their eggs and then die. They're, they exist less than a day in the air. The, the fleeting life of the least of these is enfolded with affection by God. Continuing on, Francis insists that every creature, quote, reflects in its own way a ray of God's infinite wisdom and goodness. Thus, they are bearers of revelation. In addition, each is also a locus of divine presence, thus a place where we can encounter God. Indeed, the quote, the final purpose of other creatures is not to be found in us. Rather, all creatures are moving forward with us and through us towards a common point of arrival, which is God. So who is us? Now this encyclical was addressed to every person on the planet and to bring its teaching home specifically to Christians. Pope Francis refers to what he calls the gaze of Jesus. Living out the biblical faith in God the creator, Jesus gazed with wonder on the world's beauty and drew on its workings for his teaching. Consider the birds of the air, the lilies of the field, he used tiny mustard seeds, lost sheep, mother hens, vineyards, sunsets, and nesting birds. With moving tenderness, he reminded his disciples that each one is important in God's eyes. Why, God knew and cared for even one dead little bird that could be sold for half a penny. I think of that these days when I pass roadkill. 
the tangible and loving relationship that Jesus had with creation meant that he was not someone who despised the body like later unhealthy dualism, which disfigured the gospels as Francis writes. Rather, he loved the earth. And then very briefly, Laudato Si also speaks of the presence of the risen Christ through every, uh, throughout all of creation, indeed, in every flower. When the life of the church is in union with the heart of God revealed by the gaze of Jesus and made present in the risen Christ, then us expands to wider dimensions. Almost with agony, Laudato Si applies this view to the ongoing disaster of the extinction of species. We are living in a time of a great dying off. Each year sees the disappearance of thousands of plant and animal species, mainly due to human action. Our children will never see them because they are gone forever. And Francis writes, quote, if we truly understood our community with all that exists, we would feel the extinction of species as a personal disfigurement. In pondering that phrase, I thought to myself, I think of a personal disfigurement of a veteran coming back from wars, having lost a limb, or a victim of domestic violence who bears on her face the mark of abuse. But to think of the extinction of species as disfiguring myself, I confess I am not there yet. This is the challenge. Once our minds and hearts turn toward creation, Laudato Si counsels, then we will start to feel intimately united with all that exists. What will be taking place is conversion, ecological conversion, turning, opening up in faith to the earth, loving it as God loves it, and so enfolding other creatures with our affection. And then care for our common home will become not something added on, but part of loving our neighbor, of loving us. So to work this out concretely, I'd like to think with you about one group of creatures, namely animals, non-human ones. You move to our second point here. Can we imagine animals as part of us? And I stress, this is not a fantasy, a Disney fantasy but it's an ecological reality and a religious and theological reality. Let scripture get us started. Truth be told, I assumed that the Genesis story of creation pretty much summed up biblical teaching about the subject. God created animals and called them good. But research has made me aware that scripture reveals ever so much more Namely, that there is a dynamic, mutual relationship between the all holy God and animals independent of human beings. And doesn't this give them more standing as part of us? Consider, from the divine side, so to speak, God creates animals, swarms of creatures on land and sea and air, creatures of every kind, the repeat of that phrase of every kind in Genesis 1 points to the vast biodiversity that the creature, creator calls forth. For the creator loves pizzazz, as Annie Dillard wrote. Speaking directly to the birds and the fishes in Genesis 1, the creator gives them the vocational charge to multiply. And overall, the unassailable divine judgment is made. They are good. But to this relationship based on creation, in the flood story, Genesis 9 adds the fierce closeness of a covenant. 
quote, when the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. Genesis 9, 16. Every animal on earth, furred, feathered, or finned, exists in a vis-a-vis -vis covenant relationship with the living God by God's free choice. Furthermore, the creator feeds and waters them, finds them suitable homes, delights in their ways, watches over them, knows their struggles and their suffering, is present in their dying, cares about their death, and saves them, promising them life in the new creation. The intimacy of this relationship comes to expression in a text that expresses broad divine knowledge and deep affection. And I quote here from Psalm 50. For every wild animal of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the air, and all that moves in the field is mine. From the animal side, so to speak, these creatures respond to God's loving kindness in the course of their neurologically sensitive lives. They carry out the vocation to increase and multiply, thus participating in the ongoing work of creation. They cry to God for food. They groan when it is lacking. They make intelligent use of their habitats. They reveal divine truth and they give praise and glory to God. Their relationship to God is captured in a telling text. And I quote here, Psalm 145. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. Think of that, the eyes of the owl, the multifaceted eyes of the fly, the liquid eyes of the dog, and so on, looking to God. Now, the living God not only creates and covenants and cares for animals, but is bent on redeeming them. And this becomes something we have barely touched yet. Psalm 36 puts it forthrightly. Your steadfast love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds, you save humans and animals alike. Parsing this text, which theology rarely discusses, the biblical scholar Ken Stone, who is your neighbor, a professor at Chicago Theological Seminary, he observes that the verb translated here as save, yasha, is not a minor word in the Hebrew Bible. It is a common verbal root used in many different contexts for salvation, deliverance, liberation, and in reference to God as savior. Stone's analysis leads to a strong insight. He writes, by making animals as well as humans the object of God's salvation and using such vocabulary to do so, Psalm 36 places animals firmly within the redemptive activity of God that is understood as central to biblical religion. And in response, animals look to God and wait for the Lord. Phrases used elsewhere when a human speaker hopes for God's salvation. Furthermore, biblical texts repeatedly call upon animals to praise God and use a multitude of ways of doing so. Animals should bless, give thanks, give glory, sing, shout for joy, roar, tell, acclaim, magnify, glorify, and make a joyful noise. As we prayed earlier in the beautiful prayer service in Psalm 148, Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps, wild animals and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds. In fact, the climactic text that closes the whole book of Psalms makes animal praise well nigh universal. The last line of Psalm 150, 
Oh, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. It would be a mistake to interpret animal praise anthropomorphically as if animals had the same consciousness and linguistic capacity of human beings. But it is also not accurate to consider animal praise a metaphor, a beautiful fiction, though some interpreters do so. With a deep grasp of creation theology, the biblical writers locate the source of animal praise in their relationship precisely as creatures to their creator. And St. Augustine saw this when he wrote, quote, let your mind roam through the whole creation. Everywhere the created world will cry out to you, God made me. On all sides, they will say, God made me. Why, the very forms of created things are the voices with which they praise their creator. Animals praise God by living out their lives precisely as animals. Ken Stone eloquently sums up the point when he writes, in the roar of lions, the flight of birds, and the surfacing and splashing of distant sea creatures, the biblical writers heard responses to a God who was believed to save both human and animal. They heard and saw animal veneration of God. Now, without hearing the voices of other creatures lifted in praise, our human minds tend to overlook the real orientation to God embodied within the natural world. But with this hearing, animals witness for us a most profound truth. And I think the praise of our liturgies should be reformed to reflect this, namely, that all of us animals, humankind and other kind alike, share the identity of being created and redeemed creatures. Together, we are members of one community engaged in complex interactions, sharing the world as a gift. And then wouldn't it make sense that under threat of mass extinction, animals call to us as co-praising creatures to act to save their lives. Now, time does not permit exploration of New Testament teaching, which while it does not speak much about animals, is imbued with the creation theology of the Hebrew scriptures and includes all creatures in its wider references to the redemption of the whole world. Let me alert you, though, to the ferment around the idea of deep incarnation, as it's called, first proposed by the Danish theologian Niels Gregersen. When the word became flesh, this entailed the entrance of divinity not only into human flesh, but more deeply into the biological tissue of all life, all flesh, beautiful, vulnerable, and mortal, with which human flesh is, of course, interrelated. We might want to say the word became DNA. Right? Consequently, the cross and resurrection placed Jesus Christ in solidarity with all animals in their suffering and dying, bringing with this presence the pledge of new life. Note the hymn in Colossians 1 that sings that Christ is the firstborn of the dead, but not only the human dead, Christ is the firstborn of all creation. And the text goes on in Colossians to say, quote, this is the good news that should be proclaimed to every creature under heaven, end quote. To the best of my knowledge, that part of the hymn has not made it into our lectionary. Now coming back full circle to Laudato Si, Pope Francis expresses this biblical hope for all creation with stunning words in one of the very last paragraphs of the encyclical, writing, at the end, 
we will find ourselves face to face with the infinite beauty of God. So that a gorgeous description of heaven. At the end, we will find ourselves face to face with the infinite beauty of God. And the whole universe will share with us in unending plenitude, including each creature resplendently transfigured. So who is us? Now to conclude, we have been reflecting on how the ecological suffering of our time is impelling a redefinition of who we are as human beings to include all other beings in the biosphere who are beloved creatures of the same God with us in the one community. With this wider imagination, if we can achieve it, we need to green up liturgical prayer, preaching, hymns, theology, catechesis, ethical teaching, pastoral work, church's internal policy and public advocacy. Once we have truly appreciated the life of the other, we arrive at a new starting point for decision-making and responsible, self-sacrificing commitment to eco-justice will flow as a result. Let us conclude by tracking how the pronoun us works in Psalm 67, where its meaning is marvelously elastic. This Psalm is a short song of thanksgiving and it begins, May God be gracious to us and bless us. Now, in this first line, us as originally prayed refers to the people of Israel who are praying. But the psalmist believes that divine blessing on Israel is the mean God uses to reveal divine blessing on all the nations. So mid-psalm, this starts to happen. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for God guides them too with justice and faithfulness. Next, a good harvest has come in, and now the blessing extends to the whole earth. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, has blessed us. And the psalm ends by praying God's blessing to the farthest reaches of what people can imagine. May God continue to bless us and may all the ends of the earth revere God's holy name. Imagine praying this Psalm with the us expanded to the community of creation. Penguins and pigeons, tuna and shrimps, cats and dogs. Yes, lamentably, factory farm chickens, pigs, and cattle, along with wild wolves, kangaroos, the great gray whales, are all included in the blessing. Their faces lit with divine favor as they go about their business. May God continue to bless us would mean all of us creatures from the Arctic to the Antarctic ends of the earth. So I invite you to try this yourself, expanding us. Nothing less is worthy of the community of the church at this critical ecological moment. And nothing less is worthy of the ineffable holy God who takes the whole evolving world and enfolds it with affection. Mm -hmm.